Welcome to Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane, brought to you by the Washington Speakers Bureau. In this space, we will explore some of the most pressing challenges that leaders face today with the world's most respected, innovative, curious, and accomplished thought leaders. We'd like to welcome our host, best-selling author and co-author of the recently published book, Choose Love, Not Fear, a WSB exclusive speaker for almost 30 years, Gary Heil. This is Leadership Lessons from the Fast Lane. I'm Gary Heil. We're lucky to have with us today, Arthur C. Brooks. Arthur was the president of the American Enterprise Institute. He's the best-selling author of 11 titles, and he's a recovering professional musician, having played the French horn in orchestras from the United States to the continent of Europe. He is also presently serving as a faculty member of Harvard's Business School and its John F. Kennedy School of Government. Thanks for being with us today, Arthur. Thank you, Gary. Great to be with you. Nice to see you. Oh, thank you. And hey, listen, I love the book. Love your enemies. Love the book. I found it challenging. I found it insightful, especially given the times that we're in. I mean, every leader today is being asked to innovate faster, which of course to them means they have to embrace more diversity, more diversity of thought. They have to incite more creative conflict and having people disagree and trying to find a better future. At the same time, they have a common sense of purpose, all in an environment where we're so polarized, at least on the extremes, that people don't even want to talk to each other sometimes. Yeah, it's it tricky, seems to, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it seems to be you're suggesting in Love Your Enemies that love and loving people not like you is a fundamental attribute of leadership for the next century. Yeah, I believe it is. And I know that you think the same thing. Thanks for the kind words about Love Your Enemies. Right back at you for your book that, that just came out. I hope that everybody who's watching us goes and, you know, and reads it because it's, it's completely sensible and totally right and people will learn a lot. We see the world the same way. I mean, the truth is that, that leaders in the future can't count on or try to build on an environment of polarization. Hating your enemies, destroying your enemies is an incredibly short-term strategy. And, and in point of fact, it's actually not what people want. I mean, I look at data all the time and just politically, 94% of Americans say they hate how divided we become as a country. But at the same time, we're being encouraged by this outrage industrial complex. I mean, people who are making big money and getting famous and powerful and getting clicks and followers by setting us against each other. That can't persist. That can't last. And so leaders of the future, they shouldn't be thinking about this short-term equilibrium. They should be thinking about the long-term, what people actually want. That's what great leaders have always done and what great leaders are going to have to do too. Look past the current era, look toward the time when people are going to be demanding that we have leaders who bring us together as opposed to driving us apart. Don't you think most people want to come together, don't they, Arthur, from your data? Yeah, they absolutely do. I mean, you see, it's unambiguous when you look at it that people say that. Now, that doesn't mean they behave that way. People are funny, aren't they? I mean, people will basically, they'll take the bullying leader. And the reason for that is that if I've got only two bullies to choose from or two bullying sides to choose from, which is sometimes the case in politics and sometimes the case in business, sometimes the case in life, you'll take your bully right? You're certainly not going to take the other side's bully. The point is that, that, that leaders that are really trying to inflect the environment are the ones that break out of that paradigm. You know, when people have two lousy choices, they'll take the, the less lousy. But what they want is something good. I mean, this is the key thing to keep in mind. People want something better. And for us as leaders to point that out and to provide it. And love is an interesting word, isn't it? And, and I love the way you think about it and in your quote of Thomas Aquinas and others, mm. because when we talk about love in an organizational context, it's sometimes confusing for people. Yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, love is sort of mo in the modern context is thought of as a sentiment, kind of a soft, goofy sentiment. And, and people don't talk about love in public very much. I mean, that's your private life. Well, that's wrong. Love, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, or for that matter, Aristotle, I mean, it goes back forever, is, is, is there's nothing sentimental about it at all. It's actually tough. It's steely-eyed. To, to love is to will the good of another person. 
as another person. So they're not, not to make them a tool of your own will, but to say, okay, what's best for that person? I want it. That is the definition of what it means to love somebody else. And leaders, they better be full of love or they're going to be bad leaders. That's the bottom line. They'll be short-term coercive bullies. But if you want to be an authoritative leader, you want to bring people together. You want people to want to follow you. You got to love them. And so one of the things that I talk about, boy, this is, Gary, this has really changed my life a lot. When I was president of AEI, I learned this, that, that you need to love people and you need to tell them you love them and you need to be not embarrassed about it. I mean, even if you look like some sort of Woodstock hippie, it's all okay. And you need to help people understand what you mean by that. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a love revolutionary at this point. I'm a big believer in it. Don't you find, Arthur, that there are a lot of inherited management practices that we've inherited over the years that are uh, less than loving in what they communicate by the way we pull them off? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there have been bad leaders from time immemorial, you know, that, that are in the waste bin. And some that have actually been persistent for a little while because they've had so much power. But nobody looks back at the terrible, hateful leader and say, yeah, sure, I want more of that. No. I mean, people suffer through it, basically. And, and, and so this is the, I mean, of course, everybody's had an example of that. And what we should learn from that is don't be that. Don't be that kind of leader. Be the kind of leader that you've always wanted to have. That's the idea. Arthur, one of the things in Love Your Enemies that was really challenging to me was your talk about contempt, mm -hmm. you know, as a motive almost that's anti-loving that we get wrapped up in sometimes. Yeah, contempt is, uh, is the, the conviction of the utter worthlessness of another person. That's a definition that came from Arthur Schopenhauer, the 19th century philosopher. And when you think about it, it can sort of make sense to have contempt for somebody, that some person is, is worthless. And, and we treat other people as if they were worthless all the time. Now, now, it's very different than anger. Anger is a hot emotion. And what anger really says is, it's produced by the, you know, the limbic system of the brain. It's a primary emotion. It's almost involuntary. But what, what it says is, I care. I care what you think, Gary. I, I want to change it. And so anger actually doesn't ruin relationships. And there's very interesting research that shows that, that anger actually is uncorrelated with divorce. It's amazing, right? And when we think about you know, spouses that are about to get a divorce, they're angry with each other all the time. That's actually not the problem. And, you know, the secret to my 30-year marriage to a Spaniard is the lack of correlation between anger and divorce. I mean, it's just like, man, because we're, as the psychologist would say, we're in a very hot hedonic state a lot of the time. The problem isn't anger. The problem is not I care a lot. The problem is I don't care at all what you think because I think it's worthwhile, worthless. And that's contempt. Contempt takes anger and mixes it in with disgust, which is another primary emotion. You should never ex display disgust toward another human being because they will never forget it. If you want a permanent enemy, treat them with contempt. And the, the research is clear on this too. The, the most eff uh, efficient way to express contempt for another person, you know what it is? Roll your eyes. Eye rolling. That is the, the ultimate physical side of contempt. Um, and marriage specialists, they talk about the fact that if they can, they sit with a married couple and when one talks, the other one rolls his or her eyes, that's the leading indicator that they're actually going to get divorced. And it's because of contempt. Yeah. And love, love sort of acts as an antidote to that, doesn't it? A little bit. If I'm truly wishing the best for you and love you in a, in a secular way, isn't that sort of an antidote to yeah, that? Yeah. Level so, of Love is also a primary emotion, but it's a positive primary emotion and it neutralizes disgust. It doesn't neutralize anger necessarily because anger says I care, but it will neutralize disgust. You can't be disgusted by something and love something simultaneously. Now, the problem is how do you love something that, and when you don't feel it? And the answer is you have to will it because remember Thomas Aquinas says to love is to will the good of the other, not to feel the good of anything. And so that's what great leaders are able to do. Great leaders manage themselves toward greater love such that they don't create enemies and alienate people and, and disempower people. So it seems to me that the assumption under that is, is that leadership isn't really just a set of techniques, right? I think we would agree about that. It's not some style you choose. It's a reflection of who you are. So it seems to me that your argument uh, that I ascribe to wholeheartedly might be that the better person, the more loving person, the more fulfilled person, the person full of more gratitude has a leg up oh, in yeah. being a better leader. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and the good news about that is that everybody can become that better person. But you're exactly right, Gary. This is a very important observation that you're making. The key thing is not to learn the techniques of better manipulation of other people. The key is to work on your own virtue as a person. That is what you're working on to to actually become a better leader. Is that you know is the virtue per se? And so that's what you do. You become a better listener. You, 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 you have more positive reflections on your fellow women and men that, that work for you or work with you. And all these things, what they do is they, they, they make you into the virtuous person that people actually want to follow because that's how they sense that you will their good. And to will their good is to love them. Is there a correlation there also with happiness? I know you spend a lot of time talking about leadership and happiness to oversubscribe classes at Harvard. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it turns out everybody wants happiness. So they line up at the door to get to the to the happiness classes. I'm not going to flatter myself. I understand that I'm, I'm giving away emotional candy here. Um, but absolutely, the, the link between love and happiness is is inescapable. There's a, one of my colleagues here at Harvard, his name is George Valiant, who's a psychologist, teaches uh, a psychiatrist, actually teaches the medical school, has for a long time. He, he ran a 75 year longitudinal study on graduates from Harvard College who graduated between 1939 and 1943. So this four-year cohort included very, some very famous people like Ben Bradley and John F. Kennedy were in this cohort. And, and those who live were in this cohort for 75 years. And George Valiant, he didn't study him over the whole 75 years. He took over in the end part of the study. And what he did was he found this, the correlates with their success as as people and as leaders and as professionals and everything else in between. And, and he, you know, people asked him, so what's the conclusion? You know, you have to pull up a comfy chair and listen for two hours, huh? He said, here's the conclusion. <laughs> Happiness is love full stop. In other words, if you want to find the happy people, they're the ones who had more friendships, warmer relationships with their kids, better marriages and ongoing relationships with their mothers and fathers. That's it. You know, it's, and, 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 and by the way, this also means relationships that are religious. And so if you have faith, family, friendship, and all this stuff manifested in work, that's about love and love's about happiness. You know, in my Arthur Brooks notes that I, I keep in my drawer here, I have this wonderful expression that you've corrected from the Bible. When we often quote this money is the root of all evil. My Arthur Brooks note says that it's not money, it's the love of money yeah. in, the, in, the, in the Bible and our attachment to money. Yeah, that's right. I mean, and, and our attachment to money is a real problem for all of us, not just leaders, although leaders have a tendency toward that because they have in the United States in particular an opportunity to earn a lot of it. And, and if you're money oriented, you're going to go into professions where you can make a lot of it and you'd be very attached to it. But that's a big problem. Um, it, it, you're, you're quoting uh, St. Paul's first letter to his disciple Timothy, where he says, the, for the love of money is the root of all evil and will be pierced through by arrows. You know, but the, and, and the whole thing is like, you know, money's not bad, but being in love with money is bad. Now, why? Because remember, love is to will the good of the other. Never waste the love that you have on your heart on, on a thing. You know, the, the love of cars is the root of all evil. The love of houses, the root of stuff is the, is the root of all evil. And, and this is a really important thing to keep in mind. I mean, there is this, the old axiom is that you should only love people and use things. The problem in the modern world is that everything is pushing you to use people and love things. That's the mistake. And so, you know, we, we should remember that and say, anytime you're, you're really unhappy, you're in a funk, it's like things aren't going right in my life virtually always you can look at your own life and say, what am I, what's wrong with my attachments? I've got some disordered attachments here. And the, the best way to, to look uh, sort of forensically at your own attachments is to say, am I on the wrong side? Are my verbs and nouns messed up? Am I loving stuff and using people? Cause if I am, I'm going to wind up being unhappy. Now I need to figure out how to reorder that. I need to work on my attachments to stuff and start loving people more. And I'm gonna find myself in a happier place pretty quick. So how did we square that, Arthur, with, with this last 20 years where in most companies, shareholder value has become the only prepotent goal of many public companies. You know, how do we square that with what we're saying? 
Well, the truth is that it doesn't square very well with human behavior. I understand the theory. You know, I, I, I love St. Milton Friedman as much as the next person, <laughs> but, but you know, and what he was trying to do as an academic is he was trying to sort of boil down the theory of capitalism to one rule. And, and when he, he wrote about shareholder value maximization, he wasn't saying that there's something immoral about doing something else. He was basically saying that if you run a firm and you work on shareholder maximization, you're going to have a more successful firm. But that doesn't crowd out all the other things that you're supposed to do. The problem is people saw that and like, okay, and you got like sort of Gordon Gecko. Greed is good, <laughs> right? And that's that's wrong. Greed is really, really bad. I mean, the, the truth is that morals have to come before markets. And and, and the reason that this is a real problem is when we take this shareholder maximization model and we turn it in effectively into a, a, a monistic management technique, even a religion of business, is, is not that we treat either people horribly, except that we treat ourselves horribly in business. You know, we self-objectify. We make ourselves into homo economicus. You know, it's basically all I'm good for is profit. I have one single objective. And anytime you reduce yourself to simply your, your economic objectives, you're going to do things wrong. You're going to cut corners. You're going to be unhappy. You're going to treat people poorly. And you don't want to be that person. That's just you don't want to be an ineffective leader. You don't want to be – that's an unvirtuous way to be. So the big problem with all of that is that it, it reduces people. You know, we should never objectify anybody. Men shouldn't objectify women. People shouldn't objectify others as only a source of money, and we shouldn't objectify ourselves. We should be complete human beings that love others and love our shareholders and love our customers and we love our employees and we love our management team and we love everybody. And, and only going off that as if it were some sort of misbegotten religion objectifies ourselves, and that's wrong. Yeah, we spend so much time building systems to make sure that we do that, right? I mean, as the chairman of a couple public comp committees, I had a, a line outside my door of compensation consultants teaching me that, or trying to teach me, that if I just bribed the management team a little differently, they would perform a lot better. And sales compensation consultants are all over the place saying, if I could only find a way to bribe them and get them to care more about the money than the underlying activity, I would be better off. So much so that I remember one bank had, had gone to a large consulting company and designed a system where every employee down to the customer service rep basically was rewarded, extrinsically rewarded for every action they took. Mm -hmm. Don't we go a little overboard with trying to figure out how to manipulate people using these extrinsic rewards when we want them to care more about people? Yeah, for sure. And, and it's, it's interesting language that you're using. So I'm meant to make sure that our viewers and listeners understand extrinsic means rewards that come from the outside as opposed to intrinsically motivating rewards. In, in other words, from enjoying the relationships and the hair and activity, it has to be from the rewards. There's a ton of social psych research on this. that's really interesting. So there's a study, for example, where little kids are brought into the laboratory. And, and they're given toys and puzzles and they're having a great old time, like the playing with the truck and playing with the blocks and the whole thing. And then the researchers come in and they say, oh, what's your favorite toy? And the kid says, this truck. I say, okay, I tell you what, if you play with that truck for 15 minutes, I'll give you a cookie. It turns out that when you give them the cookie, they like playing with the truck less because they feel like they're working for it. They feel like they have to be compensated for it, which in their head makes it feel like it's a chore as opposed to an object or, or, or an activity that's based in, in their, their inherent love and in their intrinsic love. The same thing is true with the study of, of college students who are solving puzzles, which is fun, like, you know, crossword puzzles and such. People do it for fun. So they call it pastimes. And, and they, they do it and then they're offered money to do the next round of puzzles and they, their enjoyment goes down but precipitously. Anytime that a comp committee says you're going to make people love their jobs more by, by monetizing every part of their job, those people need to be fired immediately because they're incompetent. They actually don't know what they're talking about. They don't understand the basics of human behavior. What we all deserve is basically work. What we all need to look for is work where we can, can serve our, our, the passions of our soul. And there's two characteristics of jobs, of work that does that. You need to feel like you're earning your success, which means your skills meet your passions and you can accomplish something really great. And the second is that you feel like you're serving others, particularly people who have less power than you do. 
you know, when I was president of AEI, I used to ask scholars, you know, who, who are you benefiting tangibly? I mean, you're working on this farm bill white paper or something. Think of the little girl who needs the food stamps because food stamps are part of the farm bill. Now, now, now cut out the picture of the girl you think you might be helping and put her on your computer and say every morning before you start your work, I know it's esoteric, maybe it's even boring. Say, I'm doing this for her. I'm fighting for her. That's intrinsically motivating. So here's the key thing for, for leaders who are watching us. If you want people to be intrinsically motivated, which is to say to do their work joyfully and with love, you need to make sure that they can earn their success and they can serve other people. You do those two things, you win. Furthermore, for leaders themselves, make sure you're earning your success and make sure you're serving other people. And, and when all that's in sync, it's like, it's like a symphony, man. So, but why don't we, Arthur? I mean, we set up these systems and they won't go away. Yeah. It seems like the evidence shows the more engaged I am and the more I care about people, the, the higher my profits will be, the more productive I am. There's 20 years of consistent research showing that, but these things survive and have a life of their own. Why do we continue to create them? I mean, I, I asked a professor not too long ago, I said, so if grades inhibit learning, which you believe they did, I said, why grades? And he goes, because if they would never come to class if I didn't give them grades. I asked a salesperson, what would happen if you didn't pry people to sell? And his response, him in this case, said, because they wouldn't work. There seems to be some set of assumptions that underlie these things that just won't go away. Yeah, and you know, I understand that, that, that when, you, when you incentivize something, you get more of it. And when you disincentivize something, you get less of it. I mean, I get it. I mean, that's just basic supply and demand, basic economics for sure. But most of the, the motivation systems that we put in place that turn out to be counterproductive in the long term, the reason that they persist is because they're, they're kind of coercive and, and, and they sort of work in the short term. And so basically, if, you, if you're working with threats and bribes all the time, which a lot of bosses are, you know, carrots and sticks constantly, carrots and sticks are unbelievably useful if you're, if you're working month to month. And, and, and so, for example, you've got a, a crisis situation. People have to have immediate compliance. A coercive bullying leader will be all sticks and a couple of carrots, and they'll get really, really good results for a little while. The problem is that we need to be in the game for a long time. Yeah, and, and, and again, this speaks to a lot of problems that we have in the regulatory system of our business environment. I mean, I mean Sarbanes-Oxley, for example, is just – so counterproductive in the incentives that it's created for leaders, where you're looking for your quarterly earnings and your quarterly performance over and over and over and over again. And when you're constantly going to the next quarter, then you're gonna be doing carrots and sticks internally, and you're gonna be goofing around with your accounting, and you're not gonna be able to make the kind of in, uh, investments that you need to make, including the investments in people that will keep them happy and keep them engaged and keep them loving what they're doing. And, and that's the kind of incentives that, that is the answer to the question, why do these things persist? <laughs> because we're in the tyranny of the near term. Yeah, and, and it also occurs to me with these things that there is a, a belief to believe that love really will stimulate the kind of collaboration and internal cohesion that could create something much better tomorrow. You have to believe that, right? You have to believe in the in the power of ordinary people to do something extraordinary in the absence of that stuff, right? Yeah, for sure. And you know, there's all kinds of evidence that shows that it is extraordinary things in the world that are, that are, that are executed by totally ordinary people because we're all ordinary people. Yeah. And there's this <laughs> magic that comes together when a team really works. I mean, you're super interested in college football, I know. And uh, I mean, you're, I mean, what's the football helmet behind you, by the way? Who's that? Oh, the, it's a Clemson helmet. Of course, that's a Clemson helmet. You're a Clemson guy. And all right. And uh, did you play for Clemson, by the way? No, no, no. I didn't. Yeah, but you're into it, aren't you? And you know. I'm, well, I think it's pretty interesting. I'm more a fan of the football coach than I am the football team. Yeah. I, I, I mean, you've written a, about him extensively and really compellingly. Yeah. He's a, he is, he's, a, he's a very interesting leader. Yeah. And what does he do? What do all great coaches do? They take, you know, talented people, right? But, but we're just people. And they make them together do something that is just like a miracle. <laughs> and how do they do it? They do it by turning the, the ordinary through extraordinary, by bringing out the love and then making it multiply by, by synergistically linking it together. 
That's what leadership is really supposed to do. But remember the, the, the cohesion, the reason that people want to do these incredible things together so that they can, they can geometrically expand the value that they're creating is because, is because they love each other and they, or they love what they're doing or they love the leader or in the best case, all three of those things. And it's incredible. I mean, I've been part of teams that, that don't do that, that are less than the sum of their parts because the leader is incapable of doing that. I mean, I was a musician in symphony orchestras for years and years and years before I did my PhD and became a social scientist. I was a classical French horn player. And you know, I can tell you, I played in all these ensembles full of incredibly talented people that played worse because of bad leadership. But then there was, uh, there was chamber music that I would be part of that, holy cow, you know, we were pretty good individually, but when we came together and we played as a quintet, it was just, it was like magic every night. I couldn't believe it. It was just great. And that had everything to do with uh, the synergy that comes from, that comes from love and the leadership that actually makes it so. Talk to me for a second, Arthur, about purpose. Purpose has got to be a big part of why people come together. I know that you believe that to be the case, but there has to be, there has to be some reason to come together, right? Yeah. Meaning and purpose, believe it or not, there's a, a, a large research literature on meaning and purpose. And the interesting thing about it is that it's, it sort of stands apart from the happiness literature. So you'd think <laughs> on his face that, that meaning and purpose are part of happiness, but, but most psychologists believe that meaning and purpose are different than happiness, and sometimes they're opposed to happiness. And here's the argument, basically. So a lot of people who are watching us or listening to us, they're, they're not, I mean, we're all leaders in a certain way, but they're not necessarily leaders of companies. But everybody has led others, and, and, and one of the ways that, that a lot of people do it is that they're parents, right? Now, here's the interesting thing in the happiness literature. People, when they first get married, their happiness is super high. And when they have their first child, their happiness falls. Now, that's crazy, right? Because you'd think that, therefore, people would completely stop having kids. But this is an empirical regularity. You see it over and over and over again in the data. Why do people say that having kids is the, the greatest thing ever, despite the fact that I, I got the data that their happiness falls? And the answer is because the meaning and purpose goes through the roof even as their self-stated happiness falls. This is the same thing in all kinds of different parts of our lives. You find that when people go to college, their happiness falls, but their meaning and purpose rises. When people fall in love, I mean, when they're first when they're dating in this really stormy thing where you know, they wanna kill each other and they don't know whether to cry or <laughs> laugh, it's, I mean, it's, it's terrible. It's like, being, you know, it's like a period of mental illness almost for a lot of people that their happiness can be really low, but their sense of purpose and meaning is really high. When they go through a crucible, a difficult time, my son is a, is in a, is a Marine. He's in the infantry in the U.S. Marine Corps. And when he was doing his boot camp, he had to do this crucible where and he, and he had a broken foot and he had to march 48 miles on a broken foot. And, and you know, it was horrible and he was miserable. And he talks about it like, so much purpose and so much meaning and he learned so much about what he could do. And that's the key thing to understand about meaning and purpose. That's what leaders can bring to others, but that's what leaders need to actually see in themselves. There's a crucible of leadership, really difficult leadership. I was, you know, I've been talking to, you know, university presidents these days and, you know, university presidents are going through paroxysms of difficulty, but at the same time, this is their opportunity to figure out what their meaning and purpose actually is is in the difficult times. And if we lose that purpose, we lose the reason they come together and self-interest gets even bigger, right? Yeah, for sure. The, for, absolutely, for absence, sure. The absence is something to sacrifice for. Self-interest is what remains, maybe. Yeah. You know, we learn a lot of leadership by looking at people we want to emulate. Yeah. And it seems we also learn a lot of leadership by looking at people we've worked with and we go, we're never going to be like that. Yeah. Right. And, you know, when you talk about orchestras you've been in, your writing about orchestra leaders is profound. I mean, <laughs> when Max Dupree wrote Leadership Jazz, he talked about orchestra leaders as a metaphor for positive leadership. After reading your stuff, I'm not sure he ever played in an orchestra. 
Yeah, yeah, lucky him, lucky him. Um, I mean, it, it, when when you're looking at when you when you're looking at the New York Philharmonic or the Boston Symphony or or you know the Cleveland Orchestra, one of these great orchestras, um, and they, I mean, they'll. It seems like they're in you know perfect harmony and just completely full of love, et cetera. But if you saw them in their rehearsals, most likely you'd see just simmering anger. You know, just seething rage. And, and part of the reason is because there's a long tradition of symphony orchestra conductors berating and belittling and using that as a leadership device. Again, Daniel Goleman, um, my colleague up here at Harvard, who, who has written, I mean, his canonical work is, is a, an article in the Harvard Business Review, later became a book called Leadership That Gets Results. That everybody watching us and listening to us should go out and read this, this uh, article. It's very easy to find on the internet. Leadership That Gets Results, published in 2000. And, and he talks about the six, six types of leaders. What he does is he looks at 4,000 CEOs, and then he breaks them by leadership type into six different groups. And the least effective type of leader, but that gets the most immediate compliance, is uh, coercive leaders. It's the bullies. And we've, you know, we've talked about that already in this conversation. Most orchestra conductors traditionally are bullies. And, and there's a, a reason for it. They need immediate compliance, or so they think. And the result is that they get sort of sub, they get, they get compliance, but sort of substandard angry compliance. I, you know, and, and I played in orchestras for years and I would see these conductors just reduce grown men to tears in front of their 80 colleagues by, by belittling them, by humiliating them, by not letting them go to the bathroom. When they, it's just horrible stuff that they would do. And, <laughs> And, and there are coaches that work that way. And you know, fortunately, the world is not the way that it was. So it doesn't put up with that nearly as much as it would. But, but I think a new generation of leaders is also figuring out that that's not the best way to lead. I, I, I became you know, friends over the years with a conductor of the Seattle Symphony. Seattle's my hometown. And it's a guy named Gerard Schwartz. And Jerry Schwartz, who's he's about 20 years older than I am. And uh, you know, he came up in a different time. And he figured out along the way that being a good guy in the long run, gets you better music. <laughs> now, it, you gotta be careful. I mean, there's sometimes when you, you know, you need to be stern, you need to be a, a tough guy sometimes. Just because you're an authoritative, caring, loving leader doesn't mean that you can't get angry. Doesn't mean that you can't be tough. I mean, every coach can tell you that. But at the same time, the compliance that he got was voluntary compliance. And, and he turned the Seattle Symphony into a, a pretty good orchestra, into a truly great orchestra. Or really one of the great American orchestras. And he did it through his character by changing the leadership model. And, you know, I think that's one of the misconceptions uh, with using a word like love in, in a leadership uh, context is that people think that might think it's soft. I don't know what your experience has been. Mine has been that some of the most loving leaders are the biggest taskmasters. It's almost like I love you, so I'm not going to take less than your best. Yeah. And there's a huge accountability around those issues. Have you had a similar response? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. And, you know, a lot of parents think about it this way, you know, and sort of this traditional tough guy dads, which means I love you so much, I'm going to beat you up constantly. And, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to tell I, I'm going to be horrible all the time. It's like, I love you so much, I'm going to hold you to standards of account and, and, and standards of behavior that are just beyond because you're able to to comply with everything well that's that's a mistake you know you need some judiciousness you need some balance it is true that leaders who love they have really really high standards on the other hand they understand people and they understand actually what people need and and figuring that out is part of being a balanced coach and a balanced leader for sure you know um a mentor of mine died a few years ago named Warren Bennis. And when I was writing with him, he would always tell me that leaders were rarely born. They were almost evolved over time and developed by their own hard work. And your leadership thinking has infected mine. And I'm wondering, you know, did you come out of the cocoon with this kind of enlightened look at love or where was the inflection for you along the way that you began to think differently about leading? You know, I never had a leadership post in my life until I was 44 years old. Um, I, I never aspired to a leadership position at all. I mean, I, as a kid, I aspired to be the greatest French horn player in the world. I mean, isn't, this, isn't America a great country? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that's all I did. You know, I didn't go to college until I finished college when I was about 30 years old. 
and uh, and I changed careers at that point. Went to graduate school, and then I was an academic. And you know, academics are, I mean, they've got this. Basically, a lot of them have a really bureaucratic mentality. It's kind of us against the management, right? <laughs> and so I never wanted to be a dean or an department chair, let alone a university president. I wanted to write my books. I wanted to do my stuff. And then I had this weird experience where um, the American Enterprise Institute, which is a, one of the oldest think tanks in the world and one of the biggest think tanks in the world, was in the search for a president, a failed search for a president. Um, the first three people that they'd offer the job to turned them down. And somebody on the board had this bad idea, this not very bright idea of seeing whether that would be a good fit for me. And at first I'm like, that is nuts. Are you kidding? I have no aspirations for it. And then I kind of thought about it and I prayed about it. You know, it's like, who's the person that I want to be? Um, how can I actually expand myself as a person? And weird thing, they offered me the job and it was a struggle for the first couple of years. And then it turned into something really good and beautiful and something I really cared about. But along the way, I really never stopped praying to become the person that I wanted to be. And I found that that leadership journey in my own life, which was not my aspiration, nothing I ever sought, helped me to truly understand myself and helped me to develop myself in virtue. And along the way, I kept imagining, I would say, you know, I would think about the leaders that I had worked for in academia and orchestras and sports and, you know, in every context in my life. And I would say, what is the thing that I admired? And that's how I would learn about it. I was also reading more of Bennis, by the way, and you. I mean, it's like I was reading the experts along the way constantly in this process of, you know, effectively getting my nighttime MBA from the books that you guys had written. <laughs> and, and it was really important to me, but it really, really helped me a lot. But then I would also pray and meditate about this, like, who is the person that I want to imagine myself being? And who's the person I want other people to describe? And how am I going to become that person? And, and every day I found that I was less and less embarrassed to display weakness, to tell people my, my actual feelings, to you know, put on display the virtues that I was hoping to have. I'm, you know, I became very, very transparent, not just about my emotions, because I had to manage my own emotions. One of the key lessons that you learn in leadership is that that leader who can't manage her, his emotions is the leader who fails. <laughs> and so I learned to manage that, but just to, to, to be very transparent with what my values were. I mean, my values as a Christian, my values as a, as somebody who cares about other people in a particular way. And, and it served me in a way because what that said was whether people agreed with me or not, they said, I can trust that guy. And I feel that guy has my best interest at heart. And I feel that person maybe even loves me. That's how I came to it through a little bit of learning, a little sometimes periods of hardship, um, the learning that came from from studying people like you, quite frankly, and and finally trying to be true to my best nature that I would try to find through my own thoughts and prayers. The question of who do you want to be is is an intriguing question, isn't it? It's one to be self aware of who I am, but there's this aspirational thinking of who do I want to be that can change your life. It's, is that the case? And you you believe that? Yeah, I really do. I really do believe that. And I still try to follow it as well. I, I ask myself, uh, and I have a whole protocol, an inventory of things I ask myself in kind of an examination of conscience. I try to do it every day. And, and every day, I, every year on my birthday, I have a really long protocol of questions that I ask myself. And I try to kind of rank myself in a bunch of moral dimensions. Am I living up to the person that I want to be? And, and if I'm not, I need to either figure out why or imagine again the standards to which I want to live my life. Um, it's funny, you know, you'd think that, that just partying hard and having no morals, if it feels good, do it is the, is, is the, you know, like the Woodstock motto that that's the, <laughs> that that's the secret to a good life. It's not the secret to a good life. That's the sort of the, the useful idiot approach of this, you know, unbridled selfishness and libertinism. If you want to be happy, you got to serve, man. I mean, you got to earn your success. You, you have to work and sacrifice because that's the, that's the life in life. And to live up to that, you have to hold yourself to a high standard of account. And to do that, you have to live a very self-reflective life. So the privilege of my life, it has really been my leadership journey because it has forced me, it has given me the privilege of, of thinking about the person uh, that I want to be, thinking of the statue, you know? It's like, if people were to say long after I'm dead, I admire that guy, what would they be saying? 
it wouldn't be my worst self. <laughs> it would only ever be my best self. Okay, now, now be that guy, be that statue. And wow, it's really changed my life and I'm happier. As, mu as much as anything else, I'm just happier as a result. You know, I'm reminded of uh, another old article that Chris Archers wrote years ago, Teaching Smart People to Learn, where he hypothesized that so many leaders stop learning and their learning muscles atrophy over time when they get successful. I think what you described in a journey was really, it seems to me, I'm reading it as a learning jury, a curiosity, a, a humble curiosity about the future that continues to, to challenge you even as we speak. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, 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 we never learn anything. And I, I always find that I'm always capable of new errors. <laughs> I was capable of, I'm always capable of new big mistakes. It's like, wow, I just drove into that ditch. I can't believe it. <laughs> and the result of it is that you're never there, right? I mean, you found that in your own career too, haven't you? I mean, you're, you're a lifelong learner. I just you know, read your brand new book and, and you're talking about new stuff that you've been learning and you've been at this for, for decades. That's... Yep. That's great, isn't it? I mean, that's the fun. That's that's the fun in it, isn't it? <laughs> it, it what well, is for me? I mean, there there are those aha days, the WTF days. I like to call them a little bit, yeah. where I get I learn something and I go, "How could I have been so wrong for so long?" Yeah, yeah, it yeah. No, I know, I know, I know, I know. And then you correct it, and you actually see. It's funny. It's like learning a new, you know, phrase in a language. And and you, when you learn something new. You know, or for if you learn, you know, if you learn, a, a, you know, some new vocabulary in Spanish, then suddenly you hear it every place, and it turns out it's been there all along. The same thing is true in any discipline. So you you learn a new technique um, by by virtue of paying attention to what's right, and then you're like, oh wow, that's been there the whole time. I just never saw it. Life is better now. Life is easier now. That's why learning is important. It is. And I, and I, I back at you with that. I think that the word I continue to take with me besides love out of your last book is contempt. And that if I even hear it around me or in my own voice, I do a check three or four times and that it gave me a vocabulary to realize we all fall off the wagon once in a while and how yeah. harmful it is. So I thank you for that too, Arthur. Thank a couple you, quick, a couple quick questions for you. What are you reading? Oh yeah. So, um, right now, um, I am reading, well, I'm always reading weird stuff. So I'm actually reading for the first time since I was 22 years old, I'm reading the brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Um, I mean, I'm going back to it. I got to tell you, I didn't get it when I was 22 and now I'm loving it. I'm loving every page. I, you know, I laugh out loud. It's so funny. It's so profound. It's so full of wisdom. And it's amazing because it's like a billion pages long. And it's clear that he was writing linearly. You know, he, he was like, he didn't know what was going to happen next either while he was writing this. So I'm, I'm, I'm reading the, the brothers Karamazov and it's a, it's a beautiful book. It's really, really a great book, and I'm enjoying it an awful lot. Um, I'm also reading this this uh, Stanley Payne, who's a historian at the University of Wisconsin. He's the world's leading expert on the Spanish Civil War, and and you know I lived in Spain for a long time. My wife is Spanish, and I thought to myself, you know, I want to know the truth. So I'm actually reading a, a history of the Spanish Civil War. So those are two books that I'm working on right now, and of course I've got. 10 books open about management and about leadership. And I dip into at least one or two of those every single day because continuing education, right? What are you reading? Tell me what you're reading. Um, the last couple of days, I, I, I read Madeleine Albright's book last week for a reason. I, I keep going back to it a little bit because it was supposed to be a memoir, but I found her insight into her experience as Secretary of State's very interesting. So I, I've been reading that recently. And like you, I was reading a couple books. I was reading Nancy Kane's book, Up Where You Are. And I've, I've started to look at books that I think could challenge my thinking and usually does. Yeah, I know. It's sometimes uncomfortable, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but always, it's exciting in a lot of ways. Yeah. Two, two leaders, Arthur, living or dead, who most influenced your thinking or you most admired? Hmm. Two leaders who most of it. And so let's see. That's a good one. St. Benedict, who completely changed the course of the Roman Catholic Church. 
And he did it um, virtually single-handedly by pointing out, by saying the things that people thought, but they were afraid to say. Um, so he's a really interesting character in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. And I, I can't live up to that standard, but I admire it because what it teaches me is that when something is true and something is right, a leader has an opportunity and an obligation to say it, even when it's unpopular. So let's start with that one. The, sec and the second one, let's get, let's get somebody a little bit more contemporary in political life. Um, I'm not a political guy, and I don't care that much about politics, but I was just thinking about this the other day. Somebody I really, really admire is George W. Bush. I love George W. Bush. Uh, you know, I, I've known him a little bit over the years. I mean, you can't know him and not love him because he's an incredibly lovable person. But he's somebody that has just been... I mean, agree with him or disagree with him. He's been so true to his own convictions as a leader. And all of his convictions are based in his love for his fellow women and men. And, and again, agree with him or disagree with him. Agree or disagree with his conclusions. Somebody whose personal philosophy and leadership lessons and philosophy is based in his love for people. I really admire that. And I think that I've learned a lot from that. And I continue to as well. Last question. Can you give me your two? I, I got to get your two first. I know we got one question to go, but I got, I've learned it from you because I've always learned from you. So tell me your two. Tell me your two. Uh, that's a great question. You know, I, I've gone back and forth with these things a thousand times. I, I loved the idea of what Doug McGregor did at MIT mm. because of our field and what mm. we're in. And in a time in its infancy, when he took Joe Scanlon from a factory floor and made him a professor at MIT and where he was having his debates with Abe Maslow at Brandeis. And they were debating things that we still debate today, but he was true all the way until he died with trying to understand the nature of what we thought of human beings and how enlightened management would eventually show up. And he died frustrated because he couldn't make it happen. Mm. But the way he brought people together were all, it was always an interesting thing to me. And I, I really admire Mandela yeah. for the obvious reasons that Mandela, I, I can't imagine the pain of being locked up that long and being true to your values and your cause yeah. being that pre, pre potent. I think yeah. there are two very different people for me, but thanks for asking. Yeah, no, Mandela's great. I, I profiled Mandela in Love Your Enemies in my last book, just because I admire him so much. And because he, he, he really changed the world he changed the world in a way that, you know, he could have any, virtually any other leader would have seen a civil war after the end of apartheid in, uh, in South Africa. And he, you know, by, it was pure love too. I mean, Mandela, right? I mean, he yes. was, he learned Afrikaans in prison so that he could communicate better with his prison guards. Uh, you know, he, when he fit, it's crazy. I mean, it's like, like who would do that? When he got out, he used Afrikaans to try to bring the South African people together, never in contempt, never in hatred, always in love. And, and, and this, was an, this was an expression of the best that has been thought and said in leadership, as far as I'm concerned. I, 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 that's, a great, that's a great example of, of authentic, aspirational leadership that we can all follow. Nelson Mandela. Yeah, and the thing after, after reading your stuff, Arthur, because I spent the last couple of days with, with Love Your Enemies again for a second time. I'm still amazed when I think about contempt, again, um, influencing my life, thinking about it. How could you spend that much time being abused by your captors and have so little contempt for them when you get released? Mm. He was a master, you know, he was a... He was just the master, you know, and um, I don't know if I'd be capable of it, but when you see somebody that is the master, that shows you the standard to which we could all at least call ourselves. Yeah, and it, it shortly makes the rest of us, when we get upset about the little things in life that- I know, this traffic light is, is lasting too long. <laughs> you know, it's like my, my fries are cold, right? <laughs> I know. I wish, so if I am a Gen Z, or millennial leader, and I come to you, as they often do, I'm sure, in, in your job as professor, and you were to give them one piece of advice, just one piece of advice that would shorten their leadership journey and make it more effective, what would you tell them? I would tell them that the most important 
management lesson, the most important leadership lesson is that you need to learn to lead yourself first. That's it. I mean, it's like, there's a lot of stuff that goes into leadership. And, and again, you've written about this, but, and, and we've had to learn this as leaders ourselves, but the sooner that young leaders learn this, the better off they're going to be. And that starts by understanding yourself, being honest with yourself, and then managing yourself. That's the ultimate, I mean, the, the, ultimately the most important leadership um, imperative. And leaders who can't do that fail. Leaders who, that's a, it's an insufficient condition, but it's a necessary condition. And so that's the first thing that, that young people who are starting out their leadership journeys need to do, is learn how to lead themselves. Thank you, Arthur. And I can't thank you enough for spending time with us today. I, I am blown away by Love Your Enemies. I'm blown away more by your concepts and your thinking and your humility. I think your wisdom is beyond, beyond what most people really understand. And I thank you for challenging all of us to think differently. Thanks for being with us. Thank and you, Gary. Thank, you're welcome. And thank you, the Washington Speakers Bureau, for making this possible. Uh, Washington Speakers Bureau commitment to bringing great minds like Arthur's to the fore and asking them to challenge us with their research and their thinking is second to none. Thank you, WSB, and thank you for joining us.